Hello and welcome to this very special collaboration between the American Academy Berlin, in Berlin and the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth. I'm Christiane Hardy, Interim Director of the Dickey Center, and it is my pleasure to be in introducing our program, Superpower Laid Low, America and the World After January 6th. The insurrection against the US Capitol building on January 6th is the starkest demonstration to date of the fissures currently plaguing American democracy. At the encouragement of outgoing US President Donald Trump, an unruly mob marched on the Capitol building to press their demand that the Electoral College certification process be overturned. They broke into the building, sending members of Congress and the Vice President of the United States scurrying for shelter. While ultimately unsuccessful, this attack on the American electoral process has shaken the perception of America as the stable, steady democracy both the world and Americans themselves have come to believe it to be. What does this demonstration of the fragility of American democracy and the deep partisan divide in the United States signal to the rest of the world? How will the Biden administration, attempting to return to an engaged multilateralism following President Trump's American First policy, be received by allies and adversaries alike? American military power remains globally preeminent, but has its soft power, its ability to persuade by example, been irreparably diminished? Joining us to work through some of the implications from the events of January 6th, and what they mean for America's role in the world is a terrific panel of seasoned security professionals and scholars who together offer both practical considerations and studied analysis to our topic. Michelle Flournoy brings deep experience in the development and execution of US security policy. From 2009 to 2012, she served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy where she was the political principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense in the formulation of national security and defense policy, oversight of military plans and operations, and in National Security Council deliberations. Prior to confirmation in this role, she co-led President Obama's transition team at the Defense Department. Currently co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors, a strategic advisory firm, Ms. Flournoy has also been a distinguished research professor at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University and a former senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She co-founded the Center for New, American Strat for New American Security, a bipartisan think tank dedicated to developing strong, pragmatic, and principled national security policies. She has served as both president and CEO of this organization and remains on the board. Joining her today is Ivan Krastev, a political scientist and award-winning author who is currently the chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia, Bulgaria, and permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He has written extensively on issues related to, to democracy and global politics, including most recently, Is It Tomorrow Yet? How the Pandemic Changes Europe, The Light That Failed, A Reckoning, co-authored with Stephen Holmes, which won the 30th Annual Lionel Gulber Prize, After Europe, and Democracy Disrupted, The Global Politics on Protest. He is a founding board member of the European Council on Foreign Relations, member of the Board of Trustees of the International Crisis Group, and a contrib contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. In 2020, he won the jean A. Marie Prize for European Essay Writing. Rounding out our panelists is William Woolforth, the Daniel Webster Professor of Government at Dartmouth. He has authored, co-authored, or edited 10 books and over 60 articles on subjects ranging from the Cold War to contemporary US grand strategy. His most recent work, some of which has been translated into Chinese, has focused on the US role in the world and the global balance of power. He regularly engages with policymakers through the National Intelligence Council and has lectured and conducted seminars with defense and foreign policy institutes in Australia, Russia, the United Kingdom, and throughout Europe. He has been a consultant to the Strategic Assessment Group and the National Bureau of Asian Research. At Dartmouth, he teaches courses on international relations, Russian foreign policy, leadership and grand strategy, and violence and security. 
Serving as moderator for today's discussion and an expert on global security in his own right is Ambassador Daniel Benjamin. Currently the president of the American Academy in Berlin, Dan served as ambassador at large and coordinator for counterterrorism at the US State Department from 2009 to 2012. Prior to government service, he held senior fellowships at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the US Institutes of Peace, as well as at the Brookings Institution, where he was a senior fellow in foreign policy studies and director of the Center on the United States and Europe. He spent five years on the National Security Council staff in the 1990s, serving first as foreign policy speechwriter and special assistant to President Bill Clinton, and later as director for transnational threats. He is an award-winning writer on US foreign policy, terrorism, and international affairs. Prior to assuming the presidency of the American Academy in Berlin, Dan was the Norman E. McCulloch Jr. Director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding and my predecessor. This exceptional panel is sure to generate a terrific discussion. So let me turn it over to Dan Benjamin. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for uh, those terrific introductions. And uh, I am really delighted to be reunited uh, in, a, uh, in a joint event with the Dickey Center, uh, my home for so long. I'm sorry we're not all in um, the basement of the Haldeman Center or uh, in some other uh, uh, auditorium on the Dartmouth campus, um, but uh, such are the such are the situations uh, that we confront now because of the pandemic. And uh, in, at any rate, we don't have to worry about having diminished uh, turnout because of snow in Hanover, and we don't have to sit through whole events in uh, in our bean boots and snowshoes. Um, anyway, I'm really thrilled about this uh, panel. And I think what I would like to do, um, let me just uh, give some instructions first. We will not have, um, uh, do, not, do not hit the, the hand up button if you have it on your Zoom function, but beginning as soon as you, you like, you can certainly uh, start uh, putting questions into the Q&A, uh, in the Q&A bin, which should be uh, on the lower right side of your Zoom uh, panel. And um, what I would like to do now uh, is start off by um, asking Yvonne, uh, who um, in some ways precipitated or uh, inspired this panel, um, when he wrote a article, uh, one of his regular articles in the New York Times that was entitled, Trump has made America a laughing stock. And in um, really a pretty concise uh, uh, newspaper article, uh, to my mind, really put very uh, cogently the uh, situation that now faces uh, the Biden administration as it tries to uh, restore, at least to some extent, uh, U.S. influence in the world after really a, um, a, a tumultuous, to say, the, to say the very least, tumultuous four years that was uh, capped uh, with the astonishing developments of January 6th, which uh, uh, Chris Hardy has discussed. So um, Yvonne, you have, uh, of course, you have no responsibility for the headline, which as we all know, uh, newspaper editors uh, still enjoy absolute autonomy when it comes to that. But um, just to quote from this uh, really powerful piece, you said that the storming of the Capitol uh, showcased not simply a crisis of American democracy, but a crisis of American power. America looks dysfunctional and weak to its enemies and unreliable to its allies. Can you uh, uh, expand on that for us so that we'll um, you know, have a place to start? Thank you very much. And it's really a privilege to be part of this panel. As you said, on a column, you can write what you want with the exception of the title. Uh, because probably the title is the only thing that people read. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, listen, uh, I'm of the generation that very much came into the public life after 1989. And for us, America was a very exceptional place. When something wrong goes home, for example, in Europe and particularly in Eastern Europe, the major thing that people are saying is this cannot happen in the United States. And suddenly overnight you understand that all these things that we have been perceiving that uh, 
can happen to us but had not happened to the United States happened. And they happened not just on the January 6th, they happened for four years. And they, from this point of view, I want to make just three points, which for me are critical for the way the America is looking from outside and particularly from outside of Europe. One is that Europeans, even when very critical to the United States, have been taken for granted that there is certain foreign policy consensus on the United States or president changed. And of course, they're going to have a different priorities, but there are many things that are not changing. And from this point of view, the American elections were slightly the opposite to the Russian elections. On the Russian elections, you know who's going to be a president, but you don't know what he will do. In an American president, you don't know who's going to basically win the elections, but you don't expect the major changes. And the first thing that happened with uh, uh, President Trump is that this cannot be taken for granted anymore. Europeans are happy that President Biden has been elected. We cannot be sure what is going to happen in four years or in eight years. This lack of the foreign policy consensus in the United States is a big issue because any European politician now should calculate also the possibility that the Biden line can be changed and Biden agenda just in four years or eight years. This is new for Europe. The second thing that in my view is also quite important is that uh, Europeans have been quite often, and we like to be critical about the American power, but we have been critical about the American power always claiming how powerful, too powerful America was. So Europeans all the time have been unhappy of how powerful America was, how badly America is using its power. It was the debate during the Iraqi war and so on. Suddenly for the first time, the fear is that probably America is not as powerful as we want. And uh, opinion polls are not a great thing to read if you want uh, to understand foreign policy, but from time to time, the opinion polls are very important not to get the opinion of the people, but to get the sentiment. And suddenly it was striking in Europe to understand that majority in every single of the countries that 11 countries that ECPR have been studying, and this is the all big EU member states, suddenly the majority of the people believe that in 10 years, China is going to be stronger than the United States. Listen, not that people know much more what it means, not basically that you know exactly what being stronger is, but this is a sentiment and it is a totally new sentiment. Uh, and I do believe this is important because this type of a sentiments, they're affecting politics, particularly in a moment when the political elites feel so much under pressure that they try basically to respond to some of these public expectations. And the third thing that I want to talk from this point of view is that uh, the President Biden administration probably is going to be the most important and transformative for the future of the transatlantic relationships for several reasons. He knows Europe, Europeans know Biden, we like him. If it does not work well for these four years, I do believe it's going to be very difficult to get how it will go better. And from this point of view, of course, Americans are going to be surprised by two things on the European side. First is that we have been very much pushing and criticizing President Trump for what he's doing and not doing, uh, but European Union is a very risk averse. And not only public opinion, but also basically a lot of the policy elites. So when it comes to the tough questions about China, about Russia, uh, strangely enough, there is a very strong neutralist instinct. And this is going to be my last point. What Europeans like about the Cold War is how it ended. What basically Europeans are kind of nervous about, about this kind of a perspective, particularly of a new major confrontation with China and Russia is that we don't know how this is going to end. So you've said a lot of things and we will come back to the European Council on Foreign Relations poll, which is fascinating. Let me, um, uh, let me just uh, ask you why why this is this time around is so different because many American policymakers uh, in um, 2004 uh, said to themselves, oh my God, the Europeans in particular, but the international community in general is never going to take us seriously again because we have reelected George W. Bush who, you know, before January 6th, you could still find people who would say that he might have been the worst president in American history because 
he totally ripped up the Middle East and left it in a disastrous shape that scholars of the region, you know, are still agape at. So we were all, you know, surprised and delighted when, when the Obama administration came into office that there was a remarkable uh, return to, you know, basically the comedy that we had experienced in the past in transatlantic relations. And by the way, you know, the relationship with Europe between the Bush administration, certainly until, um, until Bob Gates came, became Secretary of Defense, um, was really bad. And, you know, we were dividing Europe between old and new, as Rumsfeld said. So why is this time around so much more catastrophic? Listen, this is a great, uh, this is a great question, and I have been asking myself quite a lot. Because honestly speaking, in Europe, you don't have a high level of anti-Americanism. Compared to 2003, 2004, you have hundreds of thousands of people, young people in the streets of Rome or Berlin and so on, protesting against the war. But in a certain way, Bush was very much disliked president in Europe, but he was also disliked in a very American way. Too powerful, trying to change the world, probably aggressive, but he was not coming as an American, let's put it like this. Uh, you dislike him, but you have the feeling that you understand him. You disagree with him, but basically you know what he stands for. And while there was a major, major, major kind of uh, anti-Americanism in certain circles, it was not about what we are seeing today. And what we see today, in my view, is not simply about Trump. We should be fair about this. For example, the response to the pandemic had an incredible impact on the Europeans. Listen, this is such a powerful country, such a rich country, such a huge part of your uh, uh, GDP goes for health. And then what is happening, not that Europeans were doing fine, so this is the other story, but we always expected Americans to be better, more effective, doing more strongly, kind of the serious power. And I do believe that the difference is that in 2003 and 2004, the critic to the United States was a moral critic. You have this power, you are misusing this power, you are putting liberal values uh, at risk of what you're doing. Now there is not anti-Americanism in Europe, but there is a doubt, can America deliver? Even when people agree with what Biden is promising to do, nobody, by the way, is questioning his intentions. Joe Biden is liked in Europe, but the problem is how strong America is and not how strong on the level of the abstract capacity. We know how strong, for example, American army is, but can any American president be involved in certain conflicts outside of the United States with the level of political polarization and where the American public stands? Uh, and I do believe this is new. So from this point of view, if you go to comparisons, probably the only valuable comparisons with the 1970s where also America was perceived as much more weaker, dysfunctional. And in Europe, this does not go, and this is, I do believe the report uh, can be misleading on this. This does not coming from a huge self-confidence on the European side. Uh, when I read uh, a lot of American comments about the European idea of sovereignty, it looks like as if Europeans believe that we are going to do better on our own. This is not the case. In a certain way, Europe behaves much more as a retired power. We want to be left alone. All this kind of a high great power stakes politics, it's not for us. We are too old for this. Okay. Um, Michelle, um, you, uh, I have always thought of you as um, one of the senior policy makers who is kind of most optimistic about America over the long term. And that optimism finds its expression in that extraordinary background you've got there. It's a sunny day again in America. Ronald Reagan's not president, but it's, uh, it's looking great. And I'm glad you had a good vacation, wherever that might be. Uh, how do you respond uh, to uh, Yvonne's uh, concerns? Well, um, look, first of all, thank you for putting together this panel. It's really timely and I think very important for us to sort, all, sort through all of this. I do believe that there has been serious damage done to American credibility. There's been a real loss of faith that is showing up in European you know, uh, public opinion polls um, because I think um, Europe and the world really has taken Trump not as some anomalous 
you know, one-time aberration, but as a symptom of something much deeper going on in the American body politic. And I think you compound that with the failure of the US system to handle the pandemic well and the economic repercussions of that. And there is this very deep seed of doubt now. Now, I do think Biden coming in is going to make a difference. Um, I think that you know the US will start showing up again. We will start consulting again. We will put allies front and center in our foreign policy, and we, you know, the administration understands the strategic and unique advantage that that provides to the United States, and that just about every problem you can imagine, we have to, we can't address it without our allies alongside us. Um, but I do think that you know there will be some overhang of skepticism and maybe even hedging behavior on the part of our allies until they see how future elections come out. You know, what will happen in 2024 and 2028? Will we veer back towards the sort of recognizable bipartisan consensus or will Trump remain a major force and we will kind of swing like a pendulum back and forth between the more reasonable recognizable consensus and the now sort of outlying perspective. Um, so I do think that skepticism will be there for a while. The one thing I, I do think we have to, this is now the optimistic point since you asked for that. Um, you know, public opinion is, you know, it's very responsive to what's immediate and here and now, but it can also shift pretty dramatically and pretty quickly. And I think I would not count the United States out in terms of our resilience. You know, when you go, whether you go back in history to the Great Depression, to post-World War II, post-Vietnam, I mean, there've been so many periods, the civil rights, you know, the 60s, look at that, that period was a huge turmoil. So many times when we were sort of counted down and out. I actually think that if the administration does get COVID under control, um, there are a lot of economists who think that the recovery will be very strong um, and, and relatively rapid. Um, if you have, you know, a lot will depend on what, where does the Republican party go in the future and is Trump remain central or is he marginalized? Um, um, and a lot depends on China. But if we invest in the drivers of our own competitiveness at home, we may end, end up looking pretty good competing with China if we play our cards right. And China has all kinds of problems that mean that it's not 10 feet tall. So I think the jury is out on whether faith can be restored. And a lot of it will be dependent upon how resilient and how well and how quickly the United States can recover. That said, it's not gonna to reset to a unipolar moment, right? We're in a different, much more multipolar environment. So US leadership by definition will look different in the future than it has in the past. Yeah, a lot to discuss there, but let me follow up with just one point. So you are, um, we have been talking mostly about Europe so far and um, you, know, you uniquely uh, of this crowd are from the hard power world. And I am wondering, particularly if you are hearing maybe a somewhat different tune from Asia, where um, first of all, there is no NATO and therefore the United States, the bilateral relationships are really important and the security relationships are really important. And uh, no one is doubting the, you know, the strength of the American military. And I'm wondering if all of that adds up to maybe a, uh, a greater welcome for the uh, uh, election of Joe Biden and a, and a quicker snapback, if you will, towards um, a reliance on, on the US. I can imagine that there would be lots of hedging there too, but I'm curious because you, you follow this a lot more closely than I do, and I'm, I'm interested in what you're hearing. No, I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, relief and uh, interest um, in terms of getting our bilateral relationships um, back on track and having the US show up in the region uh, in a more fulsome and reliable way. Um, but you know, some of the underlying landscape has changed you know, irrevocably. I mean, 
It used to be that the US was the dominant economic and security partner. For the foreseeable, you know, going forward, China will be the dominant economic partner, but the most of the countries in the region want the US to be their dominant security partner. But inevitably, they're having to navigate that minefield and they don't want to be forced to choose sides. But I think the more the US shows up in the region, the more the US builds common positions among partners and allies to push back on the most egregious Chinese behavior. Um, I think the more the US invests in efforts to reduce the risk of miscalculation and actually not only invest in deterring China, but also engaging China um, to cooperate where we can on things like climate change, but also to be very clear about where our interests are, what we will defend, where the region as a whole will push back collectively. I think that's what they're looking for. And, and I think that um, maybe the, the skepticism, either they're better at hiding it <laughs> or it's not quite as deep as it is in Europe. Yeah. Professor Walforth, it's good to see you. Um, you have devoted a lot of your scholarly career to studying uh, issues like status in international relations and, uh, and a lot of time and effort to sort of pushing back against people who we used to call declinists. I'm not sure what they are now, maybe they're mainstream, but declinists about American power. And I am, and since you take the very long view of things, I'm curious how you view uh, Yvonne's uh, uh, thesis here whether you think he's on target. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Dan, and thanks to you and Chris for putting this together to the Dickey Center and to the American Academy. Um, yeah, I can't really push back on Yvonne's core claims. If I were European, I too would be um, worried about the constancy of American purpose and power, especially given the fact that Donald Trump received more votes in 2020 than he received in 2016. With four years of experience of what kind of politician, what kind of leader this was, a huge number of Americans chose him over Joe Biden, which I think many Europeans find astonishing, perhaps even more astonishing than the second term that George W. Bush won, to refer to your other comment. But I think I have, I'd like to put three things on the table that do, in fact, push in a slightly different direction. Um, and they concern, you know, sort of how how different was I mean, what did Trump actually do? And they concern hard power and they concern soft power. So three very quick comments. So what did Trump actually do that a normal Republican president would not have done? And when I say what did he do, I mean what did he actually do as opposed to whom did he meet? He met King Jong Un. He met Putin. And I don't mean what did he say, because he said things no other Republican would ever have said. What I mean is, what did he actually do? What he did was he massively increased American defense expenditures. He did not really sever any alliances. He just bad talked them. Um, he pulled out of some international agreements. That was bad, but you can get back into them. So anyway, I just want to call into question the degree to which you infer from four years of even that extremely unusual leader that America's course in international affairs is so easy to change. It looks like it's actually not that easy to change because Donald Trump probably wanted to change it more than he was able to. So what did he actually do? That's a question. The second one is on the hard power front, everything Yvonne says, uh, I can't push back on and everything in that poll is, is probative and interesting. But the question for American allies is what's plan B? You know, what do you do if, Ameri if you don't rely on America? And I would just put it to you this way in terms of hard power. And of course, Michelle knows 10 times more about this than I do. But if they really want to go autonomous in security affairs, it's going to be a long and very expensive road. And so my guess is they're going to stick with plan A for now, even with all those reservations. So that's the second point. Uh, the third point is to, this is a little bit squishy, I'll admit, but then on the soft power element, do you not all think there's some soft power element here of we're in this together? I mean, the degree to which uh, publics in our allies and elites, but also publics are experiencing the travails of America as if they were almost participating. 
the degree to which Black Lives Matter went global, the transnational connections where, let's face it, people who also live in democracies like ours feel upset at what's happening in America, feel invested in it, feel worried about it. Aren't those concerns in some sense a indicator of remaining soft power? Wow, those are, uh, those are terrific uh, points. Uh, let's talk about the, um, uh, the first one, uh, you know, what is plan B? And I think that that European Council poll suggests that many Europeans think there is a plan B, which is don't get caught between the US and China. Um, and let's uh, steer our own course and, you know, stay away from, uh, from the hot zone. Uh, I have to say, reading that, um, reading those numbers, Yvonne, I was reminded, uh, so I was a reporter in Germany in the early 90s, and, you know, there was a poll done pretty much every year, what country does Germany want to be most like? And you know, year after year after year, Germans answered that question, we want to be like Switzerland. And it wasn't even close with anyone else. And what uh, the, that poll tells me this time is that all of Europe has become German in its thinking on, uh, on self-neutralization. Um, is that uh, the way you think of it? And I mean, it does really beg the question of what the view of China is in Europe. I had the sense that the view of China was becoming more and more skeptical and worried, but those poll numbers suggest that the public isn't there yet. It, it, it's a great question, and uh, there was a great comment. <laughs> to be honest, I very much tend to agree because like you, I don't believe that Europe in fact has a plan B. Because the moment when we talk about developing the autonomous military and defense capacities, you see what is happening with the military budgets. Even the France, the country that basically is having to talk at its military budgets. But your Switzerland uh, metaphor and basically the Swiss temptation is quite interesting. And it has three sources. One, and this is very interesting in the poll, is that on the question how, how important, strategically important American security guarantees are, only 10% of the Germans are saying extremely important. And the reason is that Europe feels secure. The paradox of Europe is that the success of the American presence for such a long time makes Europe so secure that even when basically we're worried about this and that, we're not worried to the extent that we start to feel secure in, insecure in military terms, which is strange on the basis of certain things that happened in Europe. Secondly, Europe is too big to be Switzerland. You can tolerate Switzerland, but when Switzerland is so big, you cannot tolerate it, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, because in order to be Switzerland, everybody should agree on this. S Swiss neutrality is based on the fact that nobody is against it. I, I don't see this happening, particularly in the modern world, for many reasons. And I do believe this is part of the story, but you're right. This is where is the public opinion, and for me, what was strange. This is the public opinion in the countries that you don't expect to be. For example, there was a question, I'm going to touch on China, but even on Russia what the Euro European Union should do in the case of a conflict between Russia and the United States and the plurality of polls say to stay neutral. This is certain things that is really striking, keeping in mind to what extent basically in the Polish discourse and perceptions Russia is perceived as a hard security threat. So this is one thing. And here is China. ECFIA did a survey also in, some, in the summer of last year. And we saw that view of China has been deteriorating. People started uh, to be, to see much more China as hegemon in making, which is trying to use crude power in order to push for this or that. Uh, and the success of China uh, is not based on a soft power. Europeans are not dreaming to live in the Chinese system. Uh, we can basically respect Chinese power. I don't believe that we respect Chinese political system. Uh, Europeans were very much impressed how China did with uh, uh, COVID, but no, but no European wants to be dealt with in the way the Chinese government was dealing with the Chinese. Uh, 
Uh, but this creates this strange moment in which Europe believes, okay, what we can do, we cannot re so much rely on the United States. Can we convince the Americans and Chinese to go together? And like most of you, I don't believe it's very realistic from this point of view. The idea of the strategic autonomy, in my view, is problematic, particularly if you see the technological clash. Because for me, the 5G debate, to a certain extent, very much reminds me of the Marshall Plan debates in the late 1940s. You can, Europe wants to regulate the technological world, and this could be fine if they're going to be a common technological space. But if they're going to be a Chinese technological sphere and American technological sphere, obviously nobody is going to ask for a common regulator. Uh, and, and this is a kind of a difficult moment in which Europe is, and just one last point on Bill's story, what Trump did. For Europeans, Trump did one thing that was really shattering. And this was, this is the first, or this was the first American president who made a claim that European unity is not in the America's strategic interest. And this scared all of Europeans. Because we always believe that European Union is an American project. And suddenly he said, I'm not sure that this is in American interest. I'm not sure to what extent basically it's not going to be better for us to deal on bilateral with the different European powers. And this is something that is going to stay. And one of the reasons that is going to stay is that European Union is a very fragile. We have, we're doubting America because we also we doubt ourselves. Uh, and this is what Trump did a lot. He basically, this was traumatic in my view. And this is why you're going to look to the next Republican foreign policy establishment and ask a very simple question. Do you believe that European unity is in American interest? Or do you believe that America is going to do better if European is much more, Europe is much more disunited? So that's a really fascinating question. Um, I, uh, maybe because my uh, mind isn't so flexible and I just uh, always assume that things will revert to the mean, I tend, I've always thought that the large majority of people in Republican politics actually were deeply uncomfortable with Trump's stance on Europe. Uh, there is, of course, you know, the MAGA base, um, which probably thinks that's fine, but very few of them, I mean, we have two of those people now in the House of Representatives, and it's causing tremendous turmoil. But uh, Michelle, you know uh, this crowd more than I do. I, I've sort of felt, first of all, Bill, to your remark, I think if Trump had been reelected, he would have pulled out of NATO. So we should count ourselves fortunate on that uh, score. But um, I'm curious, Michelle, if you think that um, the Trump view of uh, transactional foreign policy, yes, it may be more transactional with the future Republican leader, but um, I've always, I always thought he was out of step with his own party on that. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I would say that if you look at, you know, Republican Party elites, you know, people who are elected in elected office in Congress and so forth, people who are writing in think tanks and so forth, the Trump point of view was not widely shared. Um, it, it was, you know, it appealed greatly to his base that doesn't think a lot about foreign policy and when it does, it thinks in terms of, you know, foreign, that, you know, anything foreign is entangling and therefore to be avoided. Um, but I don't think it was representative of the sort of mainstream view in the Republican Party, which gives me some hope that there is possibility to rebuild some consensus. That said, as we've talked about conditions of change. So the truth is, even if we think that Trump was reasonably on the mark in terms of the diagnosis of the China problem. Um, nobody thinks that his strategy was very <laughs> useful or productive. And so we need to rethink a strategy towards China. And I think we'd be much better off to do that in partnership as a transatlantic you know, alliance or as not necessarily through NATO formally, but as a set of Western democracies that have some very common interests and values in approaching China. I sort of listen to you know, some of the discussion in Europe about China, and I feel like they're five years behind. They're, they're still hoping that China, through engagement and through incentives, can be, um, become a, you know, to use uh, Bob Zellick's phrase, the responsible stakeholder and part of the international system. 
I think most of the folks uh, who've dealt with China in government in the US believe that that veil has dropped. You know, that the veil of Chinese intentions has come down. They are uh, going, they're going to pursue their interests in a very assertive, if not aggressive, posture using all the instruments. And that in many cases is going to be antithetical, not only to US interests, but to Western interests, to European interests. And so I do, I have heard among European elites who focus on this issue, a more, an increasingly clear-eyed perspective about China. And I don't think we're heading towards a US-China Cold War. And I don't think we should ask any of our allies to choose sides. But we should ask our allies to recognize where we have common interests. We do not want the Chinese standards to take hold in the world of the internet and in the world of technology. We do not want to um, have a more authoritarian approach to things. You know, we want to compete with that. And if we're going to compete, we can't do it individually. US, Germany, France, whatever. We've got to do it as a set of you know democracies with a different set of a different model in mind than what China is going to try to spread through its various instruments uh, around the world um, over over the coming years. So your formulation about uh, democracy working together is really interesting to me, and I'll refer again to uh, the ECFR poll, which uh, Yvonne and his colleagues came up with. You know, four different tribes in in Europe, um, and uh, one of them is, um, you know, looking at essentially looking at the future and how and how things will evolve. One group is pessimistic; it's about twenty nine percent, I think, about a third. The other three, it's either the U.S. will pull us through, Europe will pull us through, or the West will pull us through. And it seems to me that there's a really interesting development there. And what we might be seeing is a sort of a reconfiguration, if you will, of the alliance that is less one with the US uh, pulling the cart and maybe all of the horses sort of running together to use a, a homely metaphor. Um, does that make sense to you, Bill? You were the one who was arguing, you know, we're all in this together. And I'm wondering if if these two things aren't, uh, you know, opposite sides of the same coin, can an alliance like this evolve in that direction? We don't have a lot of long, long-term experiences with democratic alliances. Well, we have a fairly long experience, I, I think. But I, I guess I would say that uh, you know, one of the commentators notes, uh, 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 an attendee notes in the comments in the chat that um, you know many of these democracies are experiencing similar problems. Uh, they may be particularly acute when uh, an armed crowd or a th th mob of thugs attacks the, uh, the country's uh, uh, capital. But, um, but, we, but many of these countries are, 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 are um, experiencing problems that are, that are similar or that have resonance in each other's country. And that I think does kind of push towards this idea that we're in this together and we need to cooperate. And I would just say this on that front. Um, if the United States had created the grand strategy that it did in the end of the Second World War, I mean, there really wouldn't be a concept called the West. I mean, the West includes China, uh, Japan, it includes South Korea, I mean, it includes Europe, it includes Pacific, uh, it includes um, uh, Australia, New Zealand. The reason these are wielded together as a kind of unit that we talk about and think about that exists both in reality and in our imaginations is I'm not being... American exceptionalist here, it is because of what the United States has wrought. And if that is torn asunder by individual decisions of countries to go in their own direction, you won't be speaking about, uh, I don't think, a, a West in, the, in, 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 that, in, that, in that sense. And if I could just quickly say one more thing about this whole question of you know, what Trump did or didn't do, is I still think he might have pulled out of NATO if he stayed in office. But if you look back, I mean, is there anything that he did that was a damaging, as damaging to American power as the decision to invade Iraq? I don't think so. I think the Iraq adventure did more to damage American power than any other single American foreign policy decision. And so it's useful to bear that in mind when we think about Trump's or the Trump phenomenon or the recent American travails 
their effects on American power. Um, I think they're substantial. I think they're important. I think we need to discuss them, and I'm glad we are discussing them. But none, in my view, knocked American power as quickly down the, in its trajectory as the ultimate outcome of that fateful decision in 2003. So um, no one will agree more violently on, on the disaster that was the uh, invasion of Iraq. I guess there, there might be one counter argument, which is that the division of America actually has had a profound impact on American power. Um, and that's really um, a counter argument that is not about uh, the global uh, power lay down, if you will, but rather about the strength of the United States and its ability to wield its power. I'm afraid we're not going to be able to, uh, we, we don't have the, uh, the metrics for, for dealing with that one. Um, but, uh, but I do think you make a, a very good point. Now, Michelle, I'm curious, one of the sort of things that the American uh, policy elite has been talking about as a way of um, regaining uh, uh, America's, it, at least a, a large part of American influence and restoring our reputation is a new kind of multilateralism. So uh, Bill Burns wrote a piece in the Atlantic saying, you know, we just can't be the same old bullies we used to be. And I think that a lot of people have in one way or another um, agreed with that. And I would suggest that many of uh, President Biden's initial moves have been done essentially to show again in the, in the words of the framers of the, con of, I'm sorry, the writers of the declaration, a decent respect for the opinion of mankind. And uh, that's, um, even though it, it serves our own interests, the, uh, the Paris Climate Accords, the WHO, things like that, but there, it's also being done to show that the United States is a legitimate uh, player again, that we are you know, all together pulling in, in the boat. So the question I have is, this new multilateralism is not just gonna be about policy moves like that, it's also gonna be about compromising and about playing in, a, in the sandbox in a more um, collegial way and not uh, throwing our weight around again. And, and the question I have for you as someone who's been in that sandbox a lot is, can we do that? I mean, are we capable of uh, losing the bad habits of, you know, saying our way or the highway? I'm, I think this is going to be one of the really big tests of the new administration. I, I think we can, um, but it, it goes to the point that we can't go back to some prior moment that where where we you know uh, where we have a better sense that America was leading in the right way it it's going to be different because we are you know we've lived through the last four years and dragged the world through it with us <laughs> we you know the world is a more increasingly more multilateral place um, but I I think that the um, reclaiming kind of a, an American leadership role as a champion, of building multilateral fora, institutions, investing to make them more effective rather than defecting from them and just criticizing them or tearing them down. I do think that's possible, but I agree it has got to be done in a way that is more consultative, more engaging of our allies, more trying to persuade them to come along with us pointing to their own self-interest, to the shared interests we have, to our shared values. So it has to be a different kind of approach. And I think, you know, you're even seeing some early signs of that, you know, as, as the administration talks about reviving the Iran nuclear agreement, they're talking about consulting first with allies, you know, sort of going back through, you know, to the EU, to others who signed the agreement, to our partners in the Middle East. And, really having deep consultations before we sort of re-engage in negotiations and so forth. And I think that is gonna to have to be the type of approach um, that, um, that we, we take to be to successful because we are in a new moment. But I think the other thing to consider, if the US does not take that role, I mean, and I think there's no chance of that in the Biden administration, but in, hypothetically, if we didn't, I would think you'd, you'd see an acceleration 
of the sort of atrophy and deterioration of the rules-based order and the institutions and so forth. So I do think uh, a, a, a sort of context appropriate type of US leadership is really, really important to reclaim and reassert going forward, not to be go back to being the sole superpower, anything like that, but just because absent that leadership, we've seen for four years what happens. And it's, it's an acceleration of mostly things that are very bad for our interests long-term. Yeah. So uh, Yvonne, you set out the problem in your article. What is your counsel to uh, American leaders who I'm sure are all, all tuning into this Zoom as to uh, you know, what is uh, the best way forward? Well, listen, I do believe Europeans, we have been great at giving advice to others. We're not great uh, to give advice to ourselves on many issues, but uh, mm -hmm. one of the interesting things that uh, I do believe also we should keep in mind is that talking also about soft power is that it's not simply that Trump polarized or made visible the polarization of the American society, but he also contributed to the polarization of European societies. So this is not that Trump does not have any friends and allies in Europe. We don't like how he treated Europe, but if you're going to see polarization in places like Poland, this is like the United States. These are two nations basically facing each other. And I'm seeing this because there was one kind of a strange positive effect of the Trump term. And this was that all these national populists in Europe suddenly became pro-American. All these people who are getting money from Putin and so on, be it Le Pen, being Salvini, being Orban, suddenly started to like the United States. And they started to like the United States for United States not being what it used to be. But now we're going to see in Europe, many of these kind of political parties and leaders starting to look for allies outside of the West. Because these people see the Biden administration as a threat. Uh, and uh, you basically know that uh, European position on Russia now on Navalny was vetoed by Hungary. You're going to see more of it within the European Union, different type of uh, policies and different type of positioning. What I do believe should happen, and I very much agree with what was said before, it's not simply that Europe should be consulted. I do believe Europe should be also put responsible for doing certain things. Uh, because it's easy to be consulted, uh, but we should take certain responsibility for things. Uh, and on the level of the policy elites, I do believe that Europeans will understand quite well some of the limits of our capacities, not simply in terms of military power, but for example, in Europe, it's very difficult to get a consensus about two of our most important neighbor powers. When it comes to Russia and when it comes to Turkey, Europe is kind of a paralyzed. Only the American presence helps to basically come with a common position. Uh, so my view is that they should be a story on which you can say, listen, don't simply criticize us, let's lead, but also take the responsibility for what is happening. And I do believe this is even on the Iran deal because, okay, it's good to have a deal on Iran, but also be sure that if something goes wrong on the Iranian side, Europeans are going to do this or this or that. And in my view, this type of a much more realist policy is going to be possible. The biggest story and the biggest change is also of the structure of the economic relationship. And from this point of view, how the post-COVID economies are going to happen, for me, is really a big issue. When I'm looking what's happening on the American stock market and what I'm seeing what is happening on the politics, you have the feeling that we're living in the world in which there is no present. Populism in the politics is about looking at the past. By the way, there was a pan-European survey in Europe a year ago, and majority of Europeans believe that the life was better before. They're not going to agree when before, but it was better before. When you see the stock market, people live only in the future. Basically, they're buying a cars that have not been produced yet. Uh, so from this point of view, this absence of present is something that worries me because this type of interest-based politics means that we should have a genuine assessment of what is going on now, not what it was before and not what could be in a positive or negative term. So, but you have an interesting people and I do believe also people like uh, Burns or Jake Sullivan and so on, they know Europe. They also know basically where Europeans stand. 
even our doubts, I don't believe are going to be surprised for them. But being a European, I do believe that what Biden needs is an early victory. Doesn't matter on what, be it on COVID, be it on certain things about climate, be it even in some type of a bilateral crisis. But it is the perception of the American weakness that can become the biggest problem for the relationship. Yeah, well, that's a great uh, jumping off point to change the direction a little bit. Bill, you, we've been talking mostly about how uh, our historic friends uh, see us. I'm interested in your thoughts on how our historic rivals see us and what the dangers are ahead, in particular in the way Russia uh, makes use of the experience uh, of January 6th, and if you have anything to say on, on China as well. I know Michelle, I think, mentioned in one something that she, in an interview she did, that they're using the images uh, to uh, considerable effect already. But I'm, I'm curious what your read of the Kremlin is when it's, on the one hand, achieved a lot of its policy goals in terms of uh, weakening the US in some material ways, and at the same time is now facing a far less uh, congenial uh, White House. I think it's important just to note in passing that one uh, salutary, I admit it's a, small, it's a small compensation, but one, I guess, salutary effect of this recent horrible crisis that we've gone through is to put the Russian meddling into perspective. So their best, their best, whatever their best shot was, it was nothing, nothing compared to what we did to ourselves. And essentially now if we look back, I mean, I'm not going to pass judgment on whether it was correct or not correct to pursue the Russia-Trump angle. But at the end of the day, what Russia was capable of doing um, in terms of meddling, let's set aside the more recent solar winds intelligence hack, it seems to be an intelligence hack so far, uh, really pales in comparison to what we did to ourselves. And so in some sense, this sense that Russia is presenting this novel challenge that we have difficulty responding to, it's imposing costs on us that we're just going to have to rethink our entire strategy. I think that's now being put in a somewhat more reasonable perspective. But yes, there's no question about it. Uh, you know, I can't, I don't have, you know, my, 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 my Zoom is not capable of getting me inside the Kremlin so I can hear what Putin is thinking. But definitely you can look at the official Russian responses and they're having a great time with this stuff, although they're now being distracted uh, by a certain mm -hmm. Navalny. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think the idea here is that America might, because of its troubles, be in more of a mood potentially to try to reach some kind of detente or modus vivendi with Russia. In other words, I think at least some Russian analysts are expecting a carrot stick approach where the Biden administration gets tough, um, talks tough, uh, but is actually more capable of and more willing to consider the possibility of cooperation on some limited range of issues than the, than the pre predecessor was capable of doing. So in that sense, there's at least some possibility of um, relaxation on that front. You saw the official statement about the uh, renewal of the New Start, where you know they explicitly said, we're, sent, we're sending a big signal to the Biden administration. And so I, I think it's not a, an unrelieved sense of only um, uh, dancing and, 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 and having vodka toasts over the travails that the United States faces. I think they're getting ready for a more competent, more focused, more together, more bureaucratically organized uh, administration to deal with. Michelle, do you have anything to add on that or how the Chinese might um, use our recent travail? I was gonna just comment a little bit about, about China because I think um, ever since the financial crisis, um, the Chinese narrative about the United States is that we are in a, a power in decline. And if they bide their time, um, things will get much easier for them in terms of asserting their leadership, asserting their role in the world, their influence, and so forth. I think when you have the kind of event that happened um, on January 6th, um, and even before that, the, uh, the protests in Washington uh, over race issues and so forth, what happens is Chinese state media picks the worst pictures, you know, the, the, the few protesters who broke windows and were violent 
or you know the storming of the Capitol by the the insurrectionists, um, and they'll just play that over and over and over, um, and and it creates this sense that the entire country is aflame, that the entire country is in chaos, and the danger. Is, so it's propaganda, but the danger is there's a certain tendency among the Chinese elite to start believing their own narrative about us. And if they believe that we failed in COVID, we're you know, in uh, an economic decline, we're totally preoccupied, we're polarized. If they really buy their own propaganda, they can be tempted into um, testing the waters of a more assertive posture, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan or South China Sea or, or whatever. And that's where the risk of miscalculation goes up. So it's not just that they're misreading us, it's that they could lead them to, to behaviors that would be very dangerous. So I do think you know, our recovery becomes very important to kind of contest that narrative, our ability to invest in our own competitiveness going forward. One of the questions in the chat was about, should we invest at home or should we spend our time trying to reclaim our status as a superpower abroad. The truth is the way we reclaim our stature abroad is by investing in the drivers of our competitiveness at home. Research and development, science and technology, smart immigration, 21st century infrastructure, higher education, all those good things. Um, because that will accelerate our recovery and recovery to a better place. And that will get at this loss of confidence in the US that many of our allies have expressed. I just want to make it's a well, good to, uh, because in my view, this is very important. Also about Russia, because in Russia, there is a generation of people who try to view what is happening to the US in the view of the experience of disintegration of the Soviet Union. So they used to be a superpower, and it happened to them why it should not happen to the United States. And I do believe this is the same like with the Chinese. If you try all the time to believe that basically United States is in the stage in which basically uh, Soviet Union and Russia was in the 1990s, this is your pay time. Uh, and uh, I do believe this is why weakness is shaping also the perception of the others, what you can do and what you cannot do in the system. Sorry for uh, interrupting. No, no, no problem. I really just wanted to say we're about to turn to the um, uh, the questions in the chat. So if you've been holding back, well, hold back no more. Um, uh, I, and the one that uh, you know caught my eye that I want to start off with is one person asked, "How important is the future development of the Republican Party for the issues we're discussing?" We touched on this a bit before, but um, you know. We could talk for a long time on this one. Michelle, what do you think? I think it's very important. Um, I think um, if the Republican Party stays uh, tied to Trump or Trump remains their sort of, you know, essential leader um, because they fear that if they challenge him, he will use his base to run people to the right of the mainstream and, you know, they'll lose office. Um, if, if they believe that, I think we're in for a very rocky, rocky road um, because you'll have this more likely this sort of pendulum swing depending on who wins elections. I think if Trump is sort of exercised uh, from the party or at least more marginalized, becomes more of a fringe vote, but a voice, but not the mainstream and the party is able to reconstitute itself around the core beliefs of you know, conservatism, then you have a chance for a more traditional bipartisan consensus. Um, because I think there are a lot of common lessons from the last 20 years that have been learned uh, across the aisle um, in terms of some greater humility with regard to the use of American hard power. Um, you know, the, the, the nature of the challenges we face demanding alliances and coalition partners if we're gonna confront climate change or a next pandemic or whatever it is effectively in the future. So I think it's a really critical question. And I think the jury's out. We'll have you know, first indicators in terms of how you know, people vote on impeachment, but most importantly, in terms of 
the candidates and slates put forward in the 2022 um, congressional election cycle. Right, and the fact that more or less moderate senators like uh, Portman of Iowa are retiring is also a worrisome sign. I'm curious, uh, Yvonne, from your uh, reading, how has um, the first, you know, week of uh, the new administration, week plus, panned out in the sense that on the one hand, uh, my, my feeling was that everyone saw the inauguration as an extraordinary moment. I mean, even in the context of American uh, inaugurations, which, you know, whose orchestrators are really good at, at hitting all the chords and really making you uh, emotional, this was a remarkable one on this at the same time, you know, we just had uh, Senator Rand Paul's vote on whether or not to even have the uh, impeachment trial. And it appeared that the Republican Party had had not really budged from its, uh, you know, its position anchored to, uh, to Donald Trump. So I'm, I'm curious, how do you add it all up? No, inauguration was a really a kind of a high moment for everybody because yeah. it reminded people what America could be. Uh, but the interesting story is that in Europe, first for two or three years, Europeans tried to talk about Trump simply as an accident. Car accident, it happens, <laughs> even in the best families. Uh, so he's not going to be perceived as a Republican. They're going to see their Steve Biggins of this world. And they're fine. Steve Biggins, the outgoing deputy secretary of state and a yeah. real establishment figure. Yeah, yeah, no, but person that Europeans understand and respect and so on. But then suddenly what happened is that you understand that Trump is much more transformative than we were ready to believe. And don't forget also in Europe, we don't, we have the feeling that also we don't know very, very new coming Democratic Party. Not on economic agenda, is part of the European mainstream to a great extent, but you don't, you see a lot of people who said America simply should stay home we should not be interested. Europeans could be a kind of a former colonial powers and so on and so on. And this is a legitimate question, by the way. So suddenly you have the feeling that you don't understand American politics as a whole. Not simply that you don't understand the Republican party, which is quite obvious. And I do believe one of the important things that is going to happen is that you have a new generation of people, both on domestic politics and on foreign policy people. And for them on both sides, they don't know each other as well. For example, if you're a young American foreign policy people, probably you speak Chinese and not Russian. Uh, you're much more interested to see what is happening in Asia and in, and in Africa than what is happening in Europe. And even for the Europeans, this is true to a certain extent, even those who graduated from the American universities. So Biden from this point of view is the best for Europe because he is the most Europe knowledgeable president in a long time. Much more Europe knowing than even Obama who was so much liked in Europe. But for us, the question is who are the next? How important for the next Europe is going to be? Uh, and, and this in my view is legitimate questions uh, because uh, uh, this is the questions coming all the time and most of these people are very America friendly. So I'm even not talking about people who are kind of doubtful about the United States. How, how much will care for the next generation of American political leaders? Hmm. Well, uh, it's, I, I was tempted to respond to your uh, remark about Chinese versus Russian uh, by saying, well, we're Americans, we don't, we don't speak a second language. And then I thought um, that in fact, uh, the Secretary of State had his first foreign call and conducted it in fluent French. So the world's turned upside down as, uh, as uh, the band played uh, when the British were defeated. Um, it's, uh, it's very hard to figure it all out. I, I do think that certainly the top policymakers um, uh, in the new administration um, certainly learned a tremendous amount from um, their previous experience uh, in government. But uh, all these generational questions are interesting. And I'm sure Michelle has had a similar feeling looking at the list coming out of the White House of, of who's being hired and say, who are those people anyway? And, you know, were they, 
were they born after 9-11? So um, it's, uh, it is definitely an interesting uh, uh, situation. So um, we have another question. US, China, and Europe each is confronting how to address big tech. How will this affect geopolitics? We've sort of talked on the margins of, of this one. Um, and some have suggested that actually um, concerted work between the US and Europe on big tech may be the high road to uh, stabilizing uh, the global situation and, and really um, uh, seizing hold of, of the standards issue that you brought up, uh, Yvonne, and really uh, establishing you know, the, the whole uh, rules-based order again. I'm curious uh, if anyone wants to opine on this one. Well, I'll just, I'll just start by saying I think there's first and foremost an economic dimension of this. I think there are key technology areas where it, it will be imperative for the United States and for our European uh, and for European countries to really invest in you know, achieving and then maintaining a cutting edge in these areas if they're going to have the sort of you know, economic competitiveness that they're hoping for in the future. Um, because you know, things like AI, things like 5G, um, these are, and a lot in biotech are gonna define you know, huge segments of the economy and what's possible. I think beyond that, the question is what standards will govern these technology, what norms, what standards, what regula regulatory approaches. And here, although we can we could have a whole seminar on the US, the differences between the current US and European approaches, I think there is a possibility that we can align on some really important issues uh, in a, in a, and counterbalance what China and Russia are showing up and trying to do in the international standard setting bodies, which is would be very detrimental if those became the global standards. So I think there's an economic dimension and there is a kind of normative standards dimension. And we will you know, hurt ourselves if we don't figure out how to cooperate more closely as allies on that. Anyone else? Yvonne? Point because I do believe here Europe can really be also hopeful, uh, helpful to the Biden administration domestically. Uh, you probably have noticed the reaction of the German Chancellor Merkel when uh, basically uh, Facebook and others uh, decided uh, and Twitter to close uh, uh, Trump's account. And the German Chancellor is not famous for being a great lover of Donald Trump. Uh, but she was afraid of the power that is concentrated in the big corporations, technological corporations. And she believed that they should be a regulation that cannot be a self-regulation of these companies. You cannot leave this to the market. And I can see also this debate going into the United States. And from this point of view, Europe can be interesting because exactly that, because we don't have these giants. Europe is consuming. Europe will try to regulate basically what Google or Facebooks are doing on the European continent. This is a great story to start to regulate together. Because if you're going to have a transatlantic standards on this about the freedom of speech, who is going to have the decisions for this or that that can be published, this is going to be very powerful. Uh, and from this point of view, because Europe is much more disinterested uh, this is not European companies. Uh, I do believe we can be a very good partner to the United States if the United States decide to go into this direction. Michelle, you, you actually know some of these uh, companies. Are they, um, are they prepared to uh, um, you know, negotiate and, and, and work with the administration um, to get this all right? Or are they going to be one of the big problems in terms of, uh, of uh, cementing a stronger alliance that has this as one of its core elements? Well, there, there's not a monolithic view among companies, but I think in general, you can say that they've migrated from a posture of a few years ago is, you know, the less we are in Washington, the less we pay, pay attention to Washington, the better we're just leave us alone and let us be a force for good in the world to now realizing that 
Um, I think especially those that are platforms, social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook and others where they've been put in the position of having to make major decisions about the free speech of a president, for example, that they really don't want, you know, they'd rather not have that responsibility in their hands. And so I think there is now a general openness to some form of regulation in key areas that in, when it comes to the misuse of these platforms for, for inciting violence or for pornography or for you know, uh, other nefarious purposes. Um, but you know, that doesn't mean that it'll be easy to decide to get everybody on board on exactly what those regulations um, will look like. That said, I agree with um, I, uh, Ivan's point that you know it's amazing how quickly American tech companies have gotten on board with European privacy regulation it's because it is an economic matter. They were going to lose a market if they didn't get with the program and make things GDPR you know or, 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 or compl or compliant, right? So I, I do think this will be an interesting area. And between you know what we've just lived through, where the Congress, I think the U.S. Congress, particularly Democrats, are very interested in exploring, and you know people like Senator Mark Warner are going to take a leadership role on this. Of is there productive and and useful regulation? And I think the tech companies are now, for the most part, realizing that they they they're going to participate in that conversation and try to, as opposed to avoiding it, try to influence you know how it come how it comes out. And in some cases, they want more regulation. Um, in other cases, they don't want it at all. So it's it's going to be an interesting negotiation. But that will definitely be a major issue, you know, in the next Congress. Well, speaking of major issues, I want to take one uh, uh, viewer's question. Uh, in part, it's a uh, return to something I asked Yvonne before when uh, I said, what do the Europeans want most? And I think you're, I don't know if it was the Europeans, Yvonne, but it was your wish that, that Biden had a, notched a big victory. But I'd be interested, um, this is a, a two-part question. What do we think the Europeans would like to see the administration do most? And uh, conversely, what would the um, administration most like to see um, Europe do uh, in, in the near term? So um, who would like to uh, take this one on? Bill. I actually get to twist my answer into something of a rhetorical point which is I would like everyone to reflect upon this and tell me if this I'm just being the professor here, I'm being an academic, but am I not seeing a contradiction in that I thought I raised that really the Trump had been, Trump as bad as he was really just on, in concrete matters did not do that many things. And the responses we've gotten both I think in this forum and on the questions have all been about speech. Uh, he said that European Union was bad for the United States. He said this, he said that. Now, if speech can be so important for Trump, why can't speech be equally important for Biden? So in some sense, why can't I answer this question by saying that what the Europeans want is in part to say nice things? Because what we've just heard from everybody is that Trump saying unnice things was probably the biggest problem. So I think if you guys are right, about how much damage Trump's words did, then I think the first step for Biden would be about rhetoric. And of course, I think we can expect him to do well on that and, and the other members of the administration to do so as well. Well, one could counter that by saying that withdrawing from the climate accords was more than speech. But Yvonne, you had your hand up, so. No, but I do believe it's a very, it's a valid point. And part of the valid point is that uh, Trump came to the Europeans to realize something that we didn't want to see before, which didn't start with Trump. That America is not interested in Europe in the way it was interested before for a very important structural reasons. And I do believe America was right not to do it. That also Europe wants on one level to be much more autonomous and independent, but on the other, we should rely on the Americans anytime we need them. So all this relationship was changing, but because people are talking nice to each other, and from this point of view, of course, Obama was the best speaker of all. Uh, even when you're shifting to Asia, you're not allowing two Europeans to complain. 
because you're doing very much in European style. And then come, comes uh, basically Trump and he's just in your face. You're not as important. See how weak you are. If I want to split you, I can split you. I'm going to sanction you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I totally, from this point of view, you're right. The change of the rhetoric is important. But it is also important in my view to see really what is the role of America in this new world? Because in the report, we have been uh, quoting Bill Clinton, which in my view said something very important in the beginning of the uh, new century when he said, America should prepare itself for the world when we are not the only superpower, but we are going to be happy to live in this type of a world in which we're not the only superpower. And I don't believe that either Americans or Europeans believe that we are very happy to, world, to live in the world in the way it looks like today because of many things that we didn't like. And this is, this is what I do believe is important. Biden can show that America still is the one that more than anybody else is shaping the international environment. So from this point of view, for me, early success is not only about words. This is also about certain things that is happening on the ground, certain things that is really changing. If I could just add, I, I also think that in addition to having a new administration show up and consult and say the right things, I think it's also, you know, where the Europeans have been reassured, it's where bipartisan consensus is held. So even with all of Trump's rhetoric, Congress was still approving and increasing the uh, monies for the European De Deterrence and Reassurance Initiative. You know, Congress was preventing Trump from making large troop withdrawals from Europe. And so where those, where we can um, demonstrate that there is still bipartisan consensus in support of Europe, in support of NATO, in support of the Transatlantic Alliance, those actions, you know, have a certain power to communicate and reassure because I think the biggest worry is not, you know, what Biden says or what Trump, you know, it's, it's really, where does this mean long-term? I mean, it's really the fear that we, they could have another Trump in four years, even if Biden did everything right for the next four. Um, and in terms of what the US wants, I actually think, you know, I do, I think a strong unified Europe is in the American interest. I think we would love, I think the Biden administration should welcome Europe stepping up and doing more. Um, you know, I'll give you a very tactical example, but, you know, when US forces were, you know, overstretched, uh, we were dealing with Afghanistan, Iraq, the remnants of Iraq, counterterrorism around the world. You sit down with a country like France and you say, how can we together approach counterterrorism in Africa? And you have the French step up and say, great, we, this is really, really vital interest to us. We're gonna lead here, here, and here. And if you could support there, there, and there, we can do this together. The US loved that, that's fantastic. You had a European partner ally stepping up and really contributing and leading. Um, and that worked for everybody. So I think the Biden administration will be very open to that kind, to Europe doing more in, in areas where it wants to assert itself. You know, if, if, if the rhetoric and the opinion polls are actually backed up by resources and commitment and action on a part of the European leaders. So um, let me offer. Uh, I think I think that's. I think Michelle is absolutely right about uh, um, a, a strong and, and uh, united Europe. Um, but I wanted to just uh, propose that of all the many many issues on the on the docket, maybe good coordination on China policy would be the top thing that that Washington wants now. I. I would uh, leave that open to the panelists to comment on that and see if they agree. I think that's right. I think China, the rise of China, managing this competition short of conflict, um, making sure that Western norms ultimately do prevail in terms of the global system. I, I think that coordinating and collaborating on how we deal with China effectively and in a clear-eyed manner um, will be very high on the transatlantic agenda. Not the only issue, but uh, that will be very important given the consequences for all of us in terms of you know, both economic prosperity, uh, rule of law and security long-term. 
Bill? Oh, okay, well, I would just say I couldn't agree more, but I do think there's a question on the table um, that we haven't really addressed. I don't know if we have time to, but it's related to sort of what we can do together or what we should do together with democratic allies. And that is, you know, how important is democracy and its promotion in our foreign policy? Um, you might think that with all these countries suffering, uh, or not all of them, but many of us uh, suffering from internal problems that seem to challenge uh, our institutions, that perhaps we would be a little bit more reticent when it comes to instructing other countries how to arrange their domestic affairs. At least some experts say that part of our problem with Russia and China is, and again, I'm not gonna comment on the veracity of this, but that they genuinely feel actually their regimes to be much more fragile than their propaganda suggests. And therefore that a robust insistence on democratic principles in a, in, that seem to imply comments about how they should run their domestic affairs uh, is something that frightens and, and, and complicates their relations. So I think it's a question of whether we and our allies want to unite around an expansionist conception of democracy or a preservation consolidationist kind of understanding of democracy. Well, I don't think there's any question, but that you're right about democracy as being a huge priority. The, Yvonne, you were about to say something. Yeah, yeah, because I agree very much both on China. And this, this is interesting because I do believe Michelle said that she has the feeling that Europeans are five years kind of later. And I agree because in Europe, still you do not have a consensus between the business community and security community. I do believe America was also like this, but in the, the last years this changed. Uh, and in also what I told the people from time to time underestimate about Europe, you have big countries like France and Germany, but European Union basically is composed of a small and mid-sized countries, and we tend to be very provincial. I don't know any Bulgarian politician who is sleepless about China. Uh, and you have all these people there. And listen, and this is important because this is a prime ministers, then ministers, uh, as a result of it, for Europe, uh, it is quite important also to go on the scale of the challenge. And here comes the democracy side, because we can go very declarative about democracy and it's not going to work. People see that there are problems on the democratic governance. There are problems because people, are, citizens are disappointed, the speed of decision-making. But also if you go with the idea of summit of democracies, which basically Biden was very interested in the beginning, who's going to be invited? Who's going to chair the rule of law? Orban or Bolsonaro? And can you simply exclude countries like India or Brazil out of this if you want to show a big show? So from this point of view, recognizing that we have a problem of reinventing a kind of liberal democracies for different century, for different economic situation, for much more interdependent world. And this is not about regime change because I, I agree very much with Bill. For China, I don't know. Russia is more fragile than it looks like. And we don't see people, <laughs> the Russian leadership probably feels even more fragile than outside obs observers. So if this is going to be the case, it means also to change the language, to go much more self-critical, to try to see where we have a real strengths and where we have a weaknesses, to go beyond this kind of a talk which we're talking. And this also is an effort. And by the way, Biden can do it because he's a people with incredible experience. He knows democracy in a good time and in a bad time. He was 1970s around. Uh, so it, he's not born in 1989. And if this is going to happen in my view, it can be a very fresh moment in the way we speak, not only nicely, but also making sense. Well, I think that's a, a pretty great place to stop. We have gone, uh, come to the witching hour. Let me just say again um, how wonderful it is to have uh, these particular expert panelists um, from, uh, from, from Sophia, from Hanover and from the Caribbean or actually Washington perhaps. Um, it's been a delight doing uh, this event with the Dickey Center, uh, my old home, and I very much look forward to doing it again. And uh, I wanna thank everyone before I sign off let me also thank the audience for some great questions. And let me just say that at least, uh, I don't know what's next at the Dickey Center, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, but our next online event uh, at the Academy uh, will be A Tale of Two Camps, Immobilities and Inequalities in the Horn of Africa by Natalie Poitz. She's one of our new fellows talking about 
uh, Yemeni and Ethiopian uh, refugees in the, in the uh, Horn of Africa. So again, thanks everyone for making the time and for uh, joining us. I think we're gonna be circling around these questions for some time to come. So all the best and thanks.